God's peace to you on this Reformation Sunday. Our text is taken from St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 34 through 46. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer. Nor from that what day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. There's a huge partisan battle going on behind and in this text. Sadducees are the conservative party. The prophets are not important to them because interpretation of the law is unnecessary as nothing in the law can change. They only concern themselves with the divine law of Moses, a.k.a. The, the Torah or the first five books of the Bible. And when they read the law, they read it as strict, strict textualists, uh, or we might say as originalists. They look only at what was written and try to follow it literally. Ideas like afterlife and judgment are ridiculous to them. The Pharisees are the liberal party. They believe that you must adapt the law to our current times and concern yourselves with asking how the law applies and relates to contemporary life. Pharisees would say things like the whole law can be summed up as you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two parties are trying to get Jesus to endorse their position. In this chapter so far, the Pharisees came to trap Jesus with a question about paying Caesar's tax. The very same day, the Sadducees came to him with a question designed to have Jesus understand how ridiculous the idea of resurrection and afterlife is by proposing a hypothetical situation about a woman who married seven brothers. Law called for a widow to marry her husband's brothers when their husbands died. She was widowed seven times. So whose husband is she in the afterlife, they ask. Jesus silences them by saying that God is the God of the living not the dead. To us, Abraham is dead, but to God, he is living. So today's text finds the Sadducees, with their microphones muted from this teaching, that God is the God of the living. So the Pharisees seize their opportunity. Jesus is on their side, they think. He did our job for us, finally shutting up the Sadducees. So let's get him on record with a good forensic question, one that will allow him to come out as a Pharisee and join the party and choose our side. So they ask a question about the law. Which commandment is the greatest? Jesus answers with the opening of the Shema Israel prayer, a prayer as common and familiar to Jews as the our Lord's Prayer is to Christians. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, 
the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Since the Pharisees prayed this prayer twice a day, they would have been very pleased with this answer, even though Jesus did change a word to the sacred prayer. He changed might, your strength and ability, to mind. Listen, O Israel, open your ears, the prayer begins. And love is commanded, and who can argue with love? It's looking very good for the Pharisees, Jesus is polling higher with them. But then he asks them, what about the Messiah? Answer me a question about him. Whose son is he? This is a slow, fat pitch right down the middle. David's son, of course. Small children know this. But then Jesus asks, how can David, a prophet and king, of Israel. When he was prophesying, that's what it means by the Spirit to speak prophecy, how is it that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Crickets. The Pharisees find themselves silenced, standing on mute right next to the Sadducees. No one could answer him because his answers frightened them. And because his answers frightened them, they ceased asking scary questions. But his answers frightened them because he is demonstrating for them exactly what happens when we question God in the law. You are seeking political or legal solutions from a God who doesn't use law to solve your sin problem and doesn't use the law to reveal to you his divine ways or his reasons. He uses the law to silence you and your absurd theories about being able to know God. On this Reformation Sunday, it is appropriate to remember Luther's small catechism and those words repeatedly used in Luther's explanations in it. We are to fear and love God so that. We, like the Pharisees, like to hear the love part. We modern Christians think we understand what that means. But fear God? Well, the fear is what causes the silence for both parties. When Jesus answers the Sadducees by saying, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they are neither married nor given in marriage, he is saying something frightening. There are things about heaven and earth and about God that you do not know and are not revealed in your law, yet you keep looking for answers in the law. God does things outside the law. God does whatever he pleases and is not bound by the law. Well, what if he chooses Gentiles? What if he chooses tax collectors? What if lepers and prostitutes and other sinners under the law are chosen before his own chosen people? Fear of the Lord then takes hold, especially when we question God, putting him to the test. So the Sadducees ceased to ask him any more questions. The Pharisees are likewise frightened into silence by the same method. In the spirit, David says, 
the Lord said to my Lord. The Shema prayer that Jesus gave as his answer begins, Listen, Israel, the Lord your God is one. One God does not sound like the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. How can God declare he is one and yet talk about sitting at the right hand of God? Isn't that more than one God? And again, Jesus is saying, God is hidden from you, not discussed in your law. He is not bound by your rules, and he chooses apart from the law. While you are certain he is using the law to reward the righteous, the truth is he is using something outside of the law to put all of his enemies under the foot of his right-hand man, who is also the Lord. Fear seizes them. Am I an enemy? They did, after all, begin the questioning of Jesus in order to entrap and arrest him. So in the end, fear shuts the mouths of both parties. The fear of the Lord was behind the very first parable of this chapter, the one I preached on just a few weeks back, the wedding guest who refused to join the party and put on the wedding robe. Friend, how did you get in here? And he was speechless. When God questions us, when God judges us, we are left speechless. This is what Martin Luther uncovered in his own life, with his own tears that arose from his own sins and his own understanding that we before God are silent and excuse whenever he questions us. Turn about being fair play. God is silent when we question him. When we question God, we are demanding, like these Pharisees and Sadducees, that he makes sense of himself by our rules. We believe everything happens by rules, by law. You hear it all the time when people say, everything happens for a reason, or it's all part of God's plan. Well, I don't know about that. Not the way we mean it anyway. What reason could God possibly give that would justify the death of your sister's grandson? And what reason is enough for you to say cancer and death that is chasing you down daily is part of a divine plan, some justification that makes human suffering okay? If you go to God with why, you will find silence until, like Job, you finally just cry out, I know what the problem is, Lord. The problem is that you gave me life in the first place at all. Go to God in the law and put him to the test and you end up silent and wishing for death. And Luther lived that terror in his own life until the day he realized that God makes righteousness out of nothing but a spoken word. God makes the universe out of nothing by a spoken word. Even as his words drive both parties to silence, Jesus tells them all how it is that God creates, namely, out of silence and death and sin. Come sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. He is the creator who creates out of nothing. He defeats the enemies, sin, death, and the devil. 
putting them under the feet of his son, Jesus Christ. That in and of itself is a promise that all enemies of Christ are defeated at the right hand of the Father. You will not find God in the rules. You will not find him in the reasons. You will not find him in the partisan parties, philosophies, or schools of thought. You will find him where he has always been found, in his Son, the Beloved, who even as you put him to the test and seek to entrap him, sits before you and speaks words of promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. You are in my hand and I will not lose a single one of you. All that is the Father's is mine. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, not by law, but by a promise, a word from the mouth of a sinner to a sinner's ears. Listen, the Lord your God is one. Amen.